Tonight I'm going to be preaching upon this subject, the therefore of forgiveness. I've entitled the message for this morning, Whom Say Ye That I Am. This is the most important question that you or I can possibly consider. Whom say ye? Not what does somebody else think. Not what does the preacher think. Not what does the world think. Whom say ye that I am? Now, he said, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What is their opinions? But notice he said, whom say ye that not I, the Son of Man, am, but that I am. Now, that is his name as God. I am that I am. I love it when they come to arrest him. And he said, whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. And almighty power drove them backwards. You see, he wasn't a victim. Never forget that. He was no victim. He's letting them know at this time that it is his will that's being done. Whom say ye that I am? You cannot deny his importance. I think it's amazing. The calendar is centered around his birth. You can't say that about any other human being. You cannot deny his importance. The answer to this question who he is determines everything else. And it answers every question. Now that's how significant this is. This is what God, I don't want to say is looking for, but how God views you is seen in how you answer this question. This is the issue. Everything else pales in importance with comparison to this issue. Who do you say that I am? Now look in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What is the general population's estimate of me? What do they think of me? Verse 14, And they said, Some say, Thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, their answer was meant to be complimentary. They put you in high cotton. They compare you with some very great men. But the answer is actually contradictory, idolatrous, just flat out wrong. Blasphemous to put him on the plane of a mere man. As great as these men were, these were sinful men. They were contradictory men. They were weak men in and of themselves, just like you and I are. And to compare him to some man is nothing less than idolatry. While this was meant to be good, it wasn't, was it? Verse 15, and he saith unto them, 
but whom say ye that I am? Whom say ye? What is your thought and opinion concerning Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth? What is in your heart, in your thoughts regarding him? Whom say ye that I, the Son of Man? Now, I love Peter's answer. Verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Did Peter understand all the implications of what he was saying? Well, no more than you and I do. <laughs> uh, no man can dive into the depths of what all this means, but it's glorious. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Jesus Christ is God incarnate. That means God in the flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He's God the Son, the Son of the living God. Now let me quote some scriptures to you. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says, In him... In this one Jesus of Nazareth, the one born in a manger, the one who is a carpenter, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. Everything that God is, sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, independent, immutable, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that's who he is. Philip said, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. What a dull statement by Philip at this time. But the Lord said, Philip, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Thomas knew who he was after the, he knew before the resurrection, but when the Lord appeared to him and showed him his hands and feet and said, be not doubtless, but, I mean, be not, uh, uh, don't doubt, but believe. How, what was Thomas's response? He bowed before him and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus Christ is God. I love saying that. Makes me feel good to say it. I love who he is. He's God manifest in the flesh. He's Lord. That's what Thomas acknowledged, my Lord and my God. Now, do you know what that means? That's not an empty title. He's the Lord of creation. He's the creator. He's the Lord of providence. That means everything that happens, he's the first cause of it. Everything, everything, everything. He's the Lord. Now you can just take that as far as you want it or you can cavil against it, but it doesn't change the fact. He controls everything. He's the Lord of salvation. Now what that means is as to whether or not you're saved, it's up to him. Now I want you to think about that. Whether or not you're saved, you don't have any control in it. It's up to him. He is the Lord. Now the Christ refers to his offices as prophet, priest, and king. That's what Christ means. The Messiah. And there's three offices. Prophet, priest, and king. Now he's that prophet. You know what that means? He's the authoritative word of God. On down in this passage of scripture he says, I say unto you. And that's what is meant by his being that great prophet. He never had to say, thus saith the Lord. All the other prophets did, but not him. He said, I say unto you. And he speaks with divine 
authority as the Word of God. He is God's priest. And he's the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Somebody says, who in the world's that? Well, if I were you, I'd be finding out. The Bible has a lot to say about this man, Melchizedek. And Christ is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the scripture says, he was without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, made like unto the Son of God, who abides a priest continually. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called, as the priest, the new and living way. Freshly slaughtered. His blood is always poignant toward God, new. But he's not a dead sacrifice. He's the living way, presenting his own blood before the Father. He is the king. Yet have I set my king, God said, on my holy hill of Zion. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of Lords. God incarnate. God manifest in the flesh and all that means. And God's Christ. Now, the next thing that occurs to me when you think about who he is is, well, what did he do? He was born. As I said, the calendar is controlled by the day of his birth, before Christ and the year of our Lord. What did he do when he was here on earth? Well, before he came to earth, I love the way he said over and over again, I came down from heaven. I came down from heaven. Before time began, according to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, he was the surety of the better covenant. Now, what's that mean? He's the surety of the better covenant. Now, two covenants. God's a covenant making, a covenant keeping God, and there are only two covenants. Somebody says, well, what about the Abrahamic covenant, the Noah covenant? Well, there's only two. The covenant of works. That was made with Adam in the garden. Now, it takes many forms, but it was made with Adam in the garden One tree, you're not to eat of it. If you eat of that tree, you will die when you eat. He didn't say if you eat. He said when you do, you shall surely die. Now, the covenant of works is doomed for failure. You know why? God said it was. You know why? Because men are involved. Mutable creatures dependent upon their ability. But there was a covenant made before the covenant of works. Now, the Old Testament, the covenant of works. The New Testament is a whole lot older than the Old. And in this covenant, before time began, God gave a great number of people to Jesus Christ. And he became their surety. What a surety is? A surety is someone who takes complete responsibility. Before time began, Jesus Christ stood as the surety of God's elect and took complete responsibility for their salvation. Now, I find that so attractive to think that he took complete responsibility for my salvation. Don't you find that attractive? Oh, I love this. And in time, he came to this earth. He said, I came down from heaven. He came to this earth, born in a stable, lived 30 years of obscurity, nobody knew anything about him, and he kept God's law perfectly. He never sinned. He's God. He can't sin. He doesn't even have the potential to sin because of who he is. He kept God's law perfectly, and everything he did was, according to the Scriptures, a fulfillment of the Scriptures. He came to fulfill God's purpose. God had this purpose in His coming. Thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. Now, He kept the law. He died on a cross. Well, why did He die? There's one reason for death, sin. The sins of God. He stood as a surety for God's people. I'll bear their responsibility. He took my sin and made it His own. That's why He died in that perfect life that He worked out is given to me. He kept the law. He died for the ungodly. He was raised from the dead because he satisfied God. 
You and me, we can't satisfy God. He did. And God raised him from the dead. Mission accomplished. Now why did he do all this? He's God incarnate. He came to this world and kept the law and died of sin, putting away death, was raised from the dead. Why did he do all of this? Well, the number one reason is it was God's purpose. Acts 2.23 says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. This was God's purpose. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is why he did all this. God's purpose. He did this to redeem a people. Matthew 121, thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. And he made a way in coming here for God to be just and justify the ungodly. You know what that means? If you're saved, the very justice of God, the absolute holiness and righteousness of God demands your salvation. That's something, isn't it? He made a way for God to be just, absolutely just, and deal with me on strict terms of impartial justice where His justice demands my salvation because of the glorious work of Christ on Calvary Street. Why did He do this? Because He loved us. Greater love Hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Who did he do this for? Don't miss this. Who did he do this for? If that's not clearly identified, it makes the other three statements concerning who he is and what he did and why he did it meaningless. If he did this for somebody who's now in hell, that means that what he did was meaningless. Who did he do this for? Everybody he stood as a surety for. The elect. His sheep. He said, I laid down my life for the sheep. Now there are sheep and there are goats. He's got a people called his sheep. The church Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He did this for his elect. He didn't do this for everybody because if he did it for everybody, everybody would be saved. Now somebody says, why didn't he do it for everybody? Well, if he didn't do it for everybody, it's best. We really believe that whatever he does is best because he's God. He knows. He glorifies himself. Where is he now? Hebrews 1.3 says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, finished his work from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Whom say ye that I am? Well, I'm going to say with Peter, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now look at verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, man, you're one smart dude. It's amazing that you figured this out. Boy, I admire you. Nothing like that at all, is it? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. But my Father, which is in heaven. Now, if you know Jesus Christ, if you believe he is who the Bible says he is, guess what? God himself 
reveal that to you. It wasn't just some man. He might have used a man's voice, but it, it was he who did the revealing. This can only be known by revelation. It can't be known by education. You can't figure this out. You can only know this if God himself makes it known to you. The Lord said in Luke chapter 10, it's the scripture says at that time Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Now, if you don't believe this, God hadn't revealed it to you. And if you believe this, God has, in fact, revealed this to you. Paul said, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. Not just to me, but in me. That I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I didn't, when God revealed, if God reveals himself to you as to who he is, when Jesus Christ revealed himself to you as to who he is, you don't have to come up to somebody and say, here's what I think. No, he's revealed him to you. You don't have to have some other man to buttress up your faith. God has revealed this to you. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18. And I say also unto thee. Now here's one of the Lord's I say. I say unto thee. Not thus saith the Lord. I'm saying this. That's where the authority comes from. He says, I'm saying this. What if I say? I say unto you. <laughs> That's all that's ever. So what? Do you think that means anything? No, it doesn't mean a thing. I say to you, like I'm. The... But when he says it, oh, I say unto you. Oh, the authority of his word, the son of the living God. Verse 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter. <clears throat> and upon this rock, now Peter means little rock, little rock. Upon this big rock, <clears throat> thou art Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, is Peter the rock upon which Christ builds his church? This contradictory, I, I love Peter. I relate with him. I'm not speaking down at him, but he was, he was a contradiction. Kind of like me and you are. He was so afraid of a maid that he um, denied Christ before men, scared to death, didn't feel comfortable going in that direction. He's the one who caved into pressure in Galatians chapter 2 and tried to identify with the Jews because he's ashamed that the uh, Jews would think wrong of him for being with the Gentiles. He was a weak man, sinful man, a man of grace. I, I love Peter. But would Christ build his church on Peter? Well, that's utter foolishness, isn't it? That is ridiculous. He's talking about Peter's confession. Upon this rock, this confession of me, <clears throat> thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this confession of me will I build my church. We need church planters. No, we don't. 
That's the last thing we need. Men getting together, we're going to plant a church or we're going to build a church. Christ is the builder of the church. Aren't you thankful it's that way? Christ is the builder of the church. And he says, upon this rock will I build my church. Now, here we have the first time in the New Testament the word church is used. Upon this rock will I build. The church is a divine. This is, I know there's a lot of stuff that goes on under the name of church. Like that rock and roll we, had, uh, we came into. They say, this is a church service. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's foolishness. That's all it is, foolishness. That's not a church service. That's, well. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> you know, I just, I just, when I came up here, I thought, what in the world? That, um, but, yeah, see, this made me forget what I was going to say. Um, the church means a called out assembly. Now, that's what the church is. It's known in two senses. The universal church, that's talking about every believer from every age. All of the elect of God from Abel or Adam to the last one feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Uh, Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5.25. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, I want to be in that church, don't you? The general assembly and church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven is what Hebrews 12.23 says. Now, somebody, I've had so many people, well, do you have a church membership? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm a member of this church. Well, do you have a role here? Uh, here? No. Nah. You know, I, what does that mean when it comes right down to it? What does that mean? Well, uh, can, do, what, why have a role? Does that mean if you're on this church role, does that mean you're on that church role? No. No, there's nothing in the Bible about that. Uh, everybody that believes the gospel and is here is a member of this church. And I mean a true member. Do we have a role? No. No, that's foolishness. Um, that's the, there's, the, there's the church universal and there's the local assembly, like this right here. The called out assembly. And here's what's special about the called out assembly. Christ promises his presence. Where two or three are gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst. Revelation 2 says he walk, He said, I walk among the golden candlesticks. And he tells us the golden candlesticks are those churches. I walk among the golden candlesticks. Church is special. It's the called out assembly. That's why the writer to the Hebrews said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another as you see that day approaching. Oh, what a blessing to be part of his church, the church of the living God. And he says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Therefore, it will be built perfectly. No worries. <laughs> no fears of failure. He's the builder of the church. And look what he says next. Verse 18. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know what that means? All of the elect will be saved and all the forces of hell and Satan cannot prevent it. He's going to knock the door down. Oh, hell puts up her door. It's nothing before his invincible, almighty, irresistible grace. He obliterates the door and he snatches out every one of his people and there's nothing that Satan can do about it. You see, he's a defeated, vanquished foe. The seed of woman shall crush your head. And that's exactly what he did on Calvary's tree. And now the gates have been beat down and all of God's elect are drawn 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're his, he's going to have you. Now you can just write that down. If you're his, he will have you. And all the forces of hell cannot prevent it because of who he is. I love that song. Hail sovereign love that first began the scheme to rescue fallen man. Hail matchless free eternal grace that gave my soul a hiding place. Against the God who ruled the sky, I fought with hand uplifted high. Despise the mention of his grace, secure without a hiding place. But thus the eternal counsel ran, Almighty love, arrest that man. Now if you're saved, he arrested you. He apprehended you. He knocked the doors of hell down and took you. Verse 19. He says to Peter, Peter, upon this rock, this confession of me, will I build my church? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now this is the verse that is used to prove that there's a pope. Peter was the first pope. And he's got authority. Whatever he binds or any other pope binds on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever he sets free on earth is set free in heaven. Now, I've got these words in my notes and I chose them carefully. I, I, my response to that how evil, how wrong, how stupid. The thought of a pope having the control of men's salvation. To give such power to a sinful, corrupt, blind man as if he could determine your eternal destiny. Now let me say this, I'm glad salvation is not in his hands. And I'm glad salvation is not in your hands. <laughs> I'd be in trouble. I'd get to, I'd, you'd get mad at me. I'd do something to offend you, and you'd say, send him to hell. Um, I'm glad salvation is not in my hands because I'd mess it up. Thank God salvation is in his hand. Now, when he says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, what's the key for? It's to open up a lock, isn't it? That's what a key's for. It's to open up a lock. He is the key to understanding the scriptures. He's the lock that opens it up. Whatever passage you're dealing with, it has to do with him. He is the key that opens up heaven. <laughs> you may enter into heaven freely if he opens up the key. He's the key to every. He, he's the key. He said, I'm the door. What's a door for? A door lets people in. By me, if any man shall enter in, he shall be saved. He's the door. If he opens to you, if he opens your heart, if he opens heaven to you, it's open. Now that's what this key is all about. I have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This confession of me, who I am. That's the key. It's not talking about some man being able to let you in or let you keep you out. That's talking about the gospel. Look what he says. He says, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, do you find freedom in the message of it is finished? 
takes the pressure off, doesn't it? It's finished. He accomplished salvation without any help from me. Oh, what freedom. What liberty. Well, I'm going to be liberated in heaven too. But if I find this message offensive here on earth, and I'm bound by this message, I won't be in heaven. I won't be in heaven. Your gospel will either loose men or it will bind men. The message of the gospel. Verse 20. Then, and this is amazing how frequently this is in the scriptures. Then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. That's over and over in the scriptures. When he'd do something, he said, don't tell anybody about it. Don't tell anybody who I am. Now, man's religion tries to market the gospel, tries to present the gospel in such a way as to sell their goods and, and make it appealing to the flesh. The Lord didn't do anything like that, did he? He said, don't tell anybody who I am. You see, the Lord wasn't trying to do anything. He wasn't trying to market himself. He wasn't trying to get men to believe on him. The Lord doesn't try to do anything. God's trying to teach me something. No, he ain't, because if he does, you're taught. <laughs> he doesn't try to do anything. He's, he's, <laughs> the declaration of who he is is what he uses to build his church. He's not trying to gain a following. He came to save his people from their sins. And that's exactly what he did. He's not, trying, he's not trying to gain a following. I saw on um, somebody's website, uh, Making Jesus Famous. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't do something like that. He's the Lord of glory. He doesn't need your attempts to make him famous. He is who he is. And we love it that way, don't we? We love him as he is. Now, I want, in closing, to call for a verdict with everybody in here. Everybody. I want to call for a verdict. Whom say ye that I am? What do you say? What does God see when he looks into your heart for the answer. What God thinks of you is seen in your answer. If you die with any other answer than Peter's, you die God's enemy. Now that's a very scary thought. Now, I can't... If I'm his enemy, I'm in trouble. And what you think of God himself is seen by what you think of his son. And if you die with Peter's answer, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You die God's beloved. First John chapter 5 verse 1 says, Whoso believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now the issue between you and God is what think ye of Christ? I want you to forget what you think about yourself. There's somebody in here thinking, am I saved? Am I not saved? Just quit thinking about yourself. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Let's pray. Lord, I, we ask in Christ's name that you would give each one of us the grace from our heart to say with Peter, Thou art the Christ, the Son 
of the living God. Bless this message for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.